We continue this morning with our scripture lessons for this, the 21st uh, Sunday in the season of Pentecost. Our first lesson is from Isaiah chapter 25. Here Isaiah pictures God's salvation as a feast of rich foods. He calls people to faith to enjoy his blessings in Christ by grace alone. On this mountain, the Lord Almighty will prepare a feast of rich food for all peoples, a banquet of aged wine, the best of meats, and the finest of wines. <clears throat> On this mountain, he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheet that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove the disgrace of his people from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. And that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. This is the word of the Lord. Our second lesson today from Philippians chapter 4, beginning at verse 4. Since Jesus saves us, as a gift of his grace, Paul calls on the Philippians and us to rejoice and to focus on that which is good and helpful for our salvation. Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, Put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you have renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you have been concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content, whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want, I can do everything through him who gives me strength. Hallelujah! This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. Hallelujah! Please stand for the gospel reading. This morning we consider Jesus' words from Matthew chapter 22 beginning at verse 1. In this lesson, we see Jesus is eager for more people to be saved. He invites others to his wedding banquet. Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a king who prepared a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his servants to those who had been invited to the banquet to tell them to come, but they refused to come. Then he sent some more servants and said, Tell those who have been invited that I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and fattened cattle have been butchered, and everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they paid no attention and went off, one to his field, another to his business. The rest seized his servants, mistreated them, and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his army and destroyed those murderers and burned their city. And he said to his servants, The wedding banquet is ready, but those I invited did not deserve to come. Go to the street corners and invite to the banquet anyone you find. So the servants went out into the streets and gathered all the people they could find, both good and bad. And the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came in to see the guests, he noticed a man who was not wearing wedding clothes. Friend, he asked, How did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. And the king told the attendants, Tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness, for there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but 
few are chosen. This is the Gospel of the Lord. Grace, mercy, and peace to yours from God the Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. This morning for our sermon we'll consider this lesson from Ephesians 1. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace. This is the word of the Lord. Again, as we go through the sermon, I'll have, there's a few slides uh, that will come up with some of the passages on. If you'd like to refer to those and look at them, you're certainly welcome to. Dear friends in Christ, well, we are now just a, a couple of days away from the 500-year anniversary of the Reformation. There's a big celebration that's going on in Madison today. I know some people from the area are tra traveling that direction. Next week at Luther, they're also hosting a, a special event in the afternoon. We are starting a brand new Bible study between services. You're welcome to come and talk about some of the history of, of the work and life of Martin Luther and how that's impacted the world. People are writing articles in the newspaper. So everyone's talking about this right now. One of the things people are talking about really what does it mean to be Lutheran. I don't know if what everybody's saying is, is correct or not. Maybe you've seen some of these things. You know, these things that say like you might be Lutheran if, you might be Lutheran if you have an uncontrollable urge to sit in the back of any room. You might be Lutheran if the real names of your relatives are Oli and Lena. You might be Lutheran if you see a visitor in church, you walk over to the person and greet them by saying, you must be new here, you're in my seat. <laughs> but another way that people often typify Lutherans is by saying that Lutherans always have a tendency to feel guilty about things. They say that you leave the potluck dinner in the church fellowship without putting away any chairs, you feel guilty. You missed in the bulletin that alphabet letters A through L were supposed to bring a hot dish and you made homemade cookies, you feel guilty. You're having a good day and you don't feel guilty, so you feel guilty. I guess maybe it's just because Lutherans take guilt seriously. But if Lutherans take guilt seriously, maybe it's because they take God seriously. And maybe it's because they take eternity seriously. And maybe it's because they take salvation seriously. So if you're a Lutheran today, I ask you to consider this. How are we saved? You know, there's a question today, if I had to ask you, salvation, whose work is it? Is it God's work, or is it our work? And how would that even break down? Is it God's work, is, it, is our salvation, is it 50% God, and 50% us, kind of a 50-50 ball? Is it 75% our work, and 25% or 75% God's work and 25% our work? Is it 95% God's work and 5% our work? What is the percentage? What would you say if I asked you to grab a pencil and write it down? What percentage of our salvation is God's work and what percentage of it is our work? Well, we'll consider that this morning as we look at these words from Ephesians chapter 1. The first verse in this section says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. Let's take that apart there. It says, He chose us. In this section, the Apostle Paul is writing to the Ephesian believers. He's talking to them about salvation. He's giving them reasons to praise God. 
And what he says here is, he, God, chose us. That word chose is a, the Greek word exalexita. Uh, we get the word election, the English word election from that word. And that word means to select or choose. What the Apostle Paul is saying here to these believers is that God selected or chose you to be one of his people. God chose you, he says. And then he goes on and he says, when did that happen? And if you look at the next line there, it says, God chose us in him before the creation of the world. Now God created the world thousands and thousands of years ago. What was God doing before he created the world? Paul gives us some insight here. Before the creation of the world, he says, God chose us to be his people. That was already in God's mind, in God's plan, before the world was even made. So I ask you now this question. This work of election. How much of that is up to you and me? How much did we do? And how much did God do? That was God's work, wasn't it? 100%. God chose you to be his very own. Well, that's what happened in eternity. The next question is what happened in history. Paul says this in Ephesians 1 verse 7. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. You know, God's plan way back in eternity doesn't do any good if something doesn't happen in the world. It doesn't happen in history. And so what Paul said, he said, this is what God did then. He says, in him we have redemption through his blood. And we always have to answer the question, who is the him? Who is he talking about here? Well, you realize he's talking about Jesus. You see, God's plan took shape when Jesus came into the world. When the fullness of time was come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law. That's what Paul said in Galatians. You remember that verse. And so God's plan in, in eternity took place in history when he sent his son, Jesus. And the thing that Paul especially notes in this verse is he says we have redemption through his blood. It wasn't just that God sent his son into the world, that the son of God came down and took on human flesh, but he also had to not just take on human flesh, but sacrifice his life. He had to shed his blood because death comes from sin. So now a death is what brings life. And Jesus' life is what brings us life. His death saves us. And that's what Paul is saying in this verse. Now here's the question for us. Whose work was that? Was that our work? Did we help bring Jesus into the world? Did we suggest that? Did we set up the timing? No, sending Christ into the world, that was God's work. 100%. That was all on him. And it didn't have anything to do with us. Well, those are two pretty important things to realize, but still that isn't enough either. Just because that was God's plan in eternity, and that's what God did in history, the real question for us is now what did God do in, in real time? In Ephesians 1 verse 9, Paul says this, And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure. You see, God did all those things, and these were his plans. This was on his mind and on his heart to do this. But it doesn't really do anybody any good if they don't know about it. If they can't believe in it. So God had to do yet one more thing. He had to make his plans and his heart known to people. 
And that's what Paul is saying here. He said, God has made known to us this mystery. God has let us know this so that we can tell you about it. So that when you hear those words, you can have this hope and confidence of what God has done. He said, God figured this out so that you could be saved. You know, we can think about that in our own lives too, right? For these people in Ephesus, it was the Apostle Paul who made sure that they knew about Jesus. Who was it in your life? Was it your parents when you were growing up? Were they the ones that made known to you the gospel because they sat you down on their knee and they read your Bible story? Because they made sure that you knew who Jesus was. Was it your parents? Or did God make known the gospel to you through a pastor or a teacher or a Sunday school teacher? That that person was the one that God used to make that message known to you in your life? Or maybe it was some friend or it was someone else. Or maybe you found a Bible, or maybe you found a devotion book, or whatever it is. You heard it on the radio. You listened to God's Word on a television show, whatever it was. God made that message known to you. And then through that message, by the power of the Holy Spirit, He brought you to faith. So that you would know who Jesus was, that you could trust in Him. Here's the question. How much of that was your work? And how much of that was God's? Was it 50-50? Was it 75-25? The work of making salvation known. The work of bringing people to faith. That's God's work. 100% God's work. That's why Paul can be so confident here about the things he's saying. Because the work of salvation, that's not something we do. It's something that God does. It was his plan in eternity. It was his plan in history. It was his plan in real time to bring that message into our hearts and lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. That God chose you to be his own. Then he sent his son. Then he sent people into your life so you could know what he's done. So that you could trust in Him and have confidence in Him. That's what the Bible says. It says He saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done. But because of His mercy. He saved us by the washing of rebirth and renewal. By the Holy Spirit. You see who gets all the credit there? God does. It's not because we're so righteous. It's not because our lives are perfect. Because we're good. It's because he's good. Paul said the same thing in Ephesians 2. For it is by grace you have been saved. Through faith. It's not from yourselves. It's the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast. You see the key words there? It's a gift. It's a gift from God. It's something that God gave you. God has been working through your life. He has been working through people in your life to give you a gift. A free gift that Paul says is all by grace. God's undeserved love. God cares about you. He wants you to be in heaven someday. That's why he rigged this whole thing up. Before the world was even created. He had you in mind. To save you. To make you his own. Now who gets the credit? How much of that was up to us? And how much of this is the work of God? It's God's work 100%. <laughs>
And he gets the glory for it too. And he gets the praise. And one of the ways that we can thank and praise God is what Paul says in verse 10. He says, we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. One of the ways that you and I can thank and praise our God is to love one another, to love people, to do good things, to love our family, to love our spouses, to love our children, to love our friends, to love people we don't know, to love people who don't even care about us. That doesn't earn us anything. We don't get brownie points from God. But we simply get to reflect the fact that we've been rescued and saved by Him. Because that's His work. You know, in our Bible study today, we're going to be talking about how Luther took guilt very seriously. Uh, in fact, there's a little reenactment where Luther takes this um, a little strap and he takes off his shirt. And he's so bothered by his sins that he starts actually beating himself over the back, over his back. And then instead of sleeping in his bed, he goes outside into the cold to sleep on the ground. Because he can't get any relief from his guilt because it troubles him so much and he decides he has to punish someone. He has, to, he has to punish himself because of the bad things that he keeps on doing in his life. And he finds no peace until he looks into the Word of God and he finds Jesus and he reads about what Jesus did and then he comes to find out that someone was punished. Jesus was punished for the sins of the world. And that through faith in him, he's forgiven and saved and at peace with God. You want to celebrate the Reformation? Stop dwelling on what you've done. Start dwelling on what Jesus has done for you. Stop dwelling on your mistakes and imperfections. And start dwelling on Jesus' perfection. Stop dwelling on earth and start thinking about dwelling someday in heaven. Because if you're a good Lutheran, you're serious about guilt. So get serious about grace.